Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I want to thank Brother Leon for affording me the opportunity to share the word with you tonight. Now, I'm going to make a statement. I may make it again later, so if I do, it's not because I'm senile. I may or may not. But, you know, we I know, I know most of y'all, and we believe here that the, everything in the Bible, every word, is inspired word of God. But I'll even go further. I believe in putting the exact order because, you know, it wasn't originally written, chapter 1, verse 2, verse 3. I believe it's in the order that it God intended. And when he come upon these men to write these uh, letters, like most of them are, the New Testament especially, I believe it was preserved and copied. Because let's be honest, folks, what we have right here is just a book printed by man in some back. Quite possibly not even here in another country. But I believe God preserved it because the Bible is the most sought after book to be destroyed in history. I mean, countless generations in countries. It's illegal in over 50 countries in the world now. So you know that'd be something to it. But, but there's a specific reason I'm saying it's in the order. And we're going to read a verse. And I'm going to be in Romans chapter 6, stay in Romans, then we're going to skip over to chapter 7. Mm -hmm. And my plan is to stay in Romans. But the way the scripture is laid out, to me, can be confusing because it looks like it's a little bit contradicting. So if you would, like us not let's skip the formality. There's no need to stand in night on the free. But I'm going to be in Romans chapter 6, starting at verse 21. Um, I'm sorry, let's start at verse 20. For when ye were yet servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye were now, that ye are now ashamed? For the end of these things is death. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the way to the sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Please help me pray. Give me a praise to me, Father. We just love you and praise you. We thank you for this opportunity to share your word. We thank you for each person that made the effort to come out and share your word. Now, Lord, I pray that everyone receives something that they can not only put into their personal life to help their walk with you, but they can use to, to help someone else. Now, Lord, I love you and praise you. You hide me behind the cross. Let not my words be heard, but your words say, Lord, if I say anything out of your will, I ask for forgiveness and repent of it now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And this verse, really in fairness, verse 23 is one of my favorite verses. Because, you know, like most of us, we've had work our whole life. But, verse 20, for when ye were yet for, sorry, my class almost up. For when ye were, once again, it didn't say if. It said when ye were, that's everybody. No matter how good you were in your past, you were serving the sin before you got born again. That's just a simple fact. For when ye were so the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye been in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. And that verse 21 is such a, to me, a, a very disturbing truth. Because, you know, I've always been a, as you can tell, a talker. And I, people, for whatever reason, have always opened up to me. And that's one of the especially working in drug rehab, you know, the chapel and Project New Talk for two years. That's one of the biggest things that keeps people from moving forward when they've had really a, a troubled path. Is the bottom line is you're ashamed of it. You know, some people are so ashamed of their past and their sin, it keeps them from living in the blessings that God has for them. Because, you know, one of the hardest people to forgive is yourself. You know, maybe I, I'm stretching, but I take the Bible and at face value, that's word. It says if you don't forgive me in their trespasses, God won't forgive you. So that includes yourself. And one of the hardest things you're able to do is forgive yourself because the bottom line is really in fairness, you might say you forgot something. No, you really know what you are. We know, most people know who they are better than other people. Or maybe I'm just a, at fault because I am very self-respecting. That's why if you notice, know, the last two times I stood before you, one time with how close you are to your sword. But remember, everyone's heard the saying, the preacher gets first, and I usually share what the Lord's dealing with me about. I need to know where my source is. I need to know what my source is. Not even know how to take hold of that sword. And then
continue to operate. So the best about examining yourself. And that's really basically what we're going to read tonight. To me, what the next few verses I read is one of the clearest, and it has to be 100% true because it's the Word of God. Paul is making a very honest self-examination. He's being honest because the Lord inspired him, but we're going to use the present tense, I am, not I was. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. But what we're reading is Paul examining himself and being transparent to, the, to his readers. And that's what we all need to do. But that's what harms Christianity more than anything. It's a phony, church-going, peace thing. I'm, you know, I heard him saying one time, you can be so heavenly-minded and you're not earthly good. We've all met that person. And it's so easy to just throw out scripture. Just because, you know, my grandpa used to have a saying, my grandpa is not a church-going man. But I've never respected a person more than him. He said, you know, just because your mouth opens and closes like a good book, don't we need truth comes out of it. And that's a lot of truth for some people. We all know those types of people. So, what fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? So what else can we think about but your sin? And once again, ladies and gentlemen, no matter how good you are or were, you still had sin in your life. And unfortunately, if you look over at 1 John, according to the Word of God, if you say you have no sin, you're what? A liar. And a liar is one of the few things God hates. Yes, God hates. And not people, but the Scripture clearly says lying is one of the things God hates. So we all have shortcomings. And, you know, I used to hear Sister Karen say, well, I said, oh, there's a difference between a sin of omission and a sin of commission. There's willful sin, and I think there's unwillful sin. You know, anytime, it's like you promise someone you're going to do something, get busy in your day, forget. In essence, you've lied to that person. So in essence, you sin and committed one of the seven sins that God hates. Not intentionally. Most born-again believers are going to intentionally lie to somebody. But especially the busy lifestyle we live, it's easy to do. So, once again, what fruit had you then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of these things is death. The only thing that ends in death, besides physical death, and I don't think it's speaking of physical death here, it's speaking of spiritual death. Eternal separation from God. Then in verse 22, but now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Verse 22 is just another way of saying you're born again. But how, if you're born again, how can you have fruit under righteousness and be free from sin except by being under the blood of Christ? Because Christ's finished work on the cross is the only thing that will free us from sin. And I love it. It says, made free from sin. You know, when you make something, there's something, you know, for, for, for the, a cook. You take flour, take a handful of flour and eat it. Don't taste it. Put a little of this in it, a little of that with it, and you have a cake, or you have biscuits, or you have gravy, all things that I love. But it's the same way with us. We take a little bit of this, it may not be any good by itself, but we add something to it, and what do we need to add to our life to make things something for our good? This. So if we're made free, what does that mean? That we are free. As I, you know, I use the example all the time. Like my dog's in the house right now because it's so hot. But if I let my dog outside, I set him free for him. Guess what? He knows he's coming back either in the house or in his pit. So he's not free. I love my old Maximus, but he's not free. He's held captive. Because if I let him just run free, he'd be gone. He'd come home when he got hungry, like I used to when I was a teenager. But the point is, there's a difference between being set free and being made free. And once again, we're made free according to this passage for stuff that's specific. Not free to do whatever you want. I know people love to say, well, the Spirit of the Lord is there's liberty. That doesn't mean you're free to do whatever you want. There's liberty to serve the Lord. But what we're talking about here now is being made free from sin. Otherwise, you are no longer bound by sin. Not that you had to sin before you got saved, but most of us chose to. I'm going to be honest. Yeah, I'll say it like this. I've probably sinned more than most in my past. But you know, every time was a conscious choice. Not one, and I, I ran with some roughneck boys. But not one time those roughneck boys make me do anything I didn't want to do. 
You might blame others for what you've done. And the biggest lie anyone ever tell, whether it be a child or adult, was Satan made me do it. Or I wouldn't have done it if it hadn't been for old so-and-so. Biggest lie you ever told. You chose to do it. If you've done something you know it was wrong, you chose to do it. You might have been deceived a little bit or maybe tricked into it. You might have went somewhere you didn't know this was going to happen. But if you're free to go, you're free to leave. But what we're talking now, this is both addressed to both the sinner, the lost person, and the saint, the saved person. But the clear message is we are made free from sin. Now, I'm going to back up a little because I'm not big of the title of my message. At first, I was going to title this message, Go Wretched Man That I Am. That's one of the scriptures we're going to admit. That's what Paul says about himself. And then I thought really more about, based on verse 23, what are, and this is really a good thought, what are you earning and what are you receiving? Now I want to read verse 23 again, Romans 6. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, even you young people, I don't know if you get an allowance or not, but you, well, you probably get trouble. You get something. But you probably usually have to do something. See, wages is something you earn. Otherwise, you have to do something earn. Like I'm going to get up in the morning, or the guy back there is going to get up in the morning, go to the steel mill and burn up and sweat to get that paycheck. You earn a paycheck. You earn wages, but a gift is completely unmerited. If, if a gift has strength attached to it, it's not really a gift, it's a bribe. So, once again, wait for something you're going to, you know, make it clear. While a gift is completely unmerited, you did nothing to deserve it, and the gift we're talking about here is eternal life. LJ said it clear this morning. It's free, unmerited. We don't do anything. We can't earn. You can't be good enough to earn salvation. You can't do enough work in the church. You can't preach enough sermon to earn salvation. Christ paid for that salvation at Calvary's cross. All we have to do is accept it. But another thought on gift. A gift is not any good unless you open it and use it. And the gift of salvation, while it was available from the moment we got old enough to make a decision for it, most of us don't accept it then. Then even after some of us don't accept it the first time it's off. You know, I can, and I've always wanted to do this. I've just been too lazy to do it. Wrap up some packages. Some in real pretty paper, and some just an old stained up nasty paper bag. And, and set them up here in front of the church. Help select people to go up and get them. I guarantee you that one of the nasty, dirty paper will be the last one to do. And you know, if I ever done that, that would be the one that had the best gift. But we're the same way. The dirtier and nastier our lives are, the harder it is to accept that gift to some of us. And it goes right back to what we read in verse 21. Because the bottom line is, when you know yourself, when you'll be honest enough with yourself, if you're not ashamed, I won't be honest. I, I don't regret, and this will be a strong thing. I don't regret anything I've done in my past. For the simple reason, it's taken everything that I've done, everything that's happened to me, to make me who I am today. What your path should be is one of two things. It's either an anchor that keeps you from your future, or it's a springboard that propels you to your future. So when I think about how the Lord spared my life, but ladies and gentlemen, when I was three years old, I was going to the windshield of the Shouldn't be a lie. When I was nine years old, I was in a car with somebody that rode 14 times and still flipped the telephone pole. Shouldn't be a lie. And I'm not going to mention all the stupid stuff I did as a teenager that was willingly, I knew the consequences. So, and, and the only reason I was there, I wasn't serving the Lord, as I've told you before. I can't think of any of my family that the church. The one thing ever says when I get to heaven, I want to ask Jesus, I want to ask Paul, I want to know the person who prays for me. I can't think of any of my family that would have. But someone had to, or, 
this is a little bit arrogant. But I, this is what I've always thought. Because the Lord knows what you're going to do. He knows what you're not going to do. And if I've ever done any, if I've ever been obedient and done anything pleasing to the Lord, I like to think that's the reason I've been preserved. But the Lord knew what I was going to do, when I was going to do it, how I was going to do it. Regardless of what my life looked like. But my fruit was completely unrighteous. And yet, I'm ashamed. Like I said, I'm going to finish my statement. I don't really regret anything in my life. I've been abused in every way you can think about being abused. Physically, verbally, sexually. That's hard for a man to say. But all those things may be who I am today. But I am ashamed of a few things I've done. And I'm thankful one day sitting in a, in a church service the preacher preached no unforgiveness. Something came to me, and not only did I have to forgive that person, but then I still did. I, I felt relief there was still something wrong. And I realized, and I'd already started preaching the gospel. I realized I had to really forgive myself. I was ashamed of some of the things I've done. And the Lord spoke to me, if you'll just ask me, I will free you from that. I did and he did. Well, I can stand before you now and say there's nothing in my past that caused me to lose food. It caused me to suffer a Why? Because I left it at the cross. I didn't, I didn't bring it to the altar and cry over it, walk off, oh, I might need that again and pick it up and go with it. That's what most of us do. We don't really leave our past behind. We don't really leave our confession at the altar, whether it be an actual altar in a church or somewhere private prayer. Too many of us like to hold on to our past. That's the reason we really are reaping the wages of sin. Because if you don't let it go, guess what? It stays with you. You know, claiming to be a Christian and not following this book is like paying money to go to a doctor and not taking the medicine. But once again, so what are you earning? Are you earning? Wages of sin unto death, or have you accepted the free gift of salvation? And if you've accepted that free gift of salvation, which I'm sure the most of you are here, I know all of you. Well, really, perhaps I don't know most of you personally, but I do know all of you, so I, I think I'm safe to say everyone here is probably born again. But, once again, do you have that pretty shelf, pretty package you got, you got saved sitting up on a shelf, or have you opened up for it to work? Are you using your free gift? That's what it's intended for. God, because if God saved us to go to heaven, why don't we go the minute we're, we're saved? God saved us so we could be his representative. Here. So if you go back into uh, Genesis where it says, let's make God in our image, that word image means representative form or figure. It don't mean God looks like us. Even as hands in the lamb, I hope God don't look like me. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> But anyway, let me go on. So let's skip over now. So once again, are you earning wages unto death? Or are you accepted and using your gift of God to eternal life? And where did that come from? Through Jesus Christ. You know, I love people love the quote, and I may be wrong on this, but I don't think I am. People love the quote, the only way to God is through Christ. But I believe there's something before that that says, unless God draws it. See, it's God that draws us and puts the desire to reach out to Jesus. Then the Holy Spirit tells us how. So take all three. The person that says, well, I've never heard from God. That person has never accepted salvation. you got to hear from God to get to Jesus. you got to go through Jesus to get to God. And you got to hear from the Holy Spirit to get to either one of them. And, thank you, Lord. See, I can really live by the scriptures. And I don't want to make a statement about being filled with the Holy Spirit. But, you know, uh, and I really felt it was the Lord, but the scripture teaches me that the Spirit, and that is capital S, I mean the Holy Spirit is subject to prophecy. You don't have to say everything that comes into your mind. It may not be the time. So we're about to fall before that's not here. But let's skip over in chapter 7. We'll go over to verse 21. Still here in Romans. Because we're talking about wages of sin and the gift of God. And I'm going to step out on one of my uh, proverbial limbs. 
This gift, while it is free and unmerited, I believe it comes with a few conditions. Not necessarily strange, because once I said, if you truly have accepted the gift of salvation, you're using it for God's glory. And if you're not using it for God's glory, I can't say, I'll never be found guilty of saying, well, it don't look, I don't think that person's going to say it. I don't know anyone's heart. Yes, the scripture teaches us we'll know a person by their fruit. Just like, I love them, let me back up a little bit. One of the headings in my, my day father is fruit produced indicates spiritual state and destiny. So the fruit you produce will show where you really are in the Lord and will also determine your eternal destiny. Because as the scripture teaches, a good fruit will not, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, a bad tree will not bear good fruit. You can't get sweet water and salty water from the same spring. But, so now we're going to skip over into chapter 7, and we're going to look at the words most of us don't like. Law. Verse 21, chapter 7. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. I'll stop there for just a moment. But then I find a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. Now, some scholars, I read some scholars, they will clearly say, some people believe this is Paul is talking about before he was born again and free from sin. Possible, but that's why I made that statement earlier. I have to believe that the Bible is in the order God intended it. And we clearly see it over here in verse 22 of chapter 6, but now, now, present tense, this is the word of Paul, being made free from sin. Then we skip over here to chapter 7. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. That inward man is referring to my spirit, the spirit. But ladies and gentlemen, it's not this flesh that will live forever. It's the spirit and soul that will go into eternity. Yes, we will get a glorified body, thank you. Won't be the ache and pain. But it's truly your spirit that will live forever. I don't think this flesh is going to enter, ever walk the streets of glory. Yes, at that point, as I said, the glorified body, we will have that body. But it won't be the flesh, because it's flesh. Because even think about it. Even Jesus, when he walked this earth, and yes, he was fully God. But as we clearly know in this church, he was fully man as well. What did he say when he was called a good teacher or a good master? Why call about me good? There is none good but one. And that's God. Why could Jesus, and it, can't, it had to be true, it came out of the mouth of Christ. So why could he say God was the only one, the Father was the only one good? Because God had never been human. He had never been by my flesh. And Jesus was. Yet without sin, but some people like to claim, well, because Jesus was God, he couldn't sin. Yeah, he could. If he was incapable of sin, how was he the perfect sacrifice? How could he take on the sin of the world if he couldn't sin? That's like us saying, if, if you know, once we get born again, it's impossible for us to sin. That'd be sinless perfection. None of us. If you've never done anything wrong since you got born again, raise your hand, please. Come up for a my place. No one? But you've been, I just read from the scripture, we've been made free from sin. And it, I'm not talking about big, there's no big sin and little sin in God's eye. You know, we like, you like, it's literally just a little white lie. Is a white lie any different than a big fat black lie, I guess? No, a lie is a lie is a lie. It's a false Whether it's intentional or not. But I think, once again, this is Paul speaking. And I feel he's speaking in the present tense. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. And think about, ladies and gentlemen, this evil, when it says evil is present with me, it's not talking about some demonic spirit or outside force. I believe with every part of my being, it's talking about your flesh. Yes, as long as we're bound by this flesh, 
Yes, we've been born again, and yes, we've been free from sin, but as I hope I've clearly stated, we still have the capacity not only to sin, but we will fall short, we will sin, we will make mistakes. Once again, I will make the same statement. Now, I hope that I never see a sin, not that there is such a thing as a big sin, little sin, but I hope the sin that is in my life until I draw my last breath is this little simple shortcoming, and I hopefully, the Holy Spirit bring to my remembrance, and I can repent and confess and be. I hope I never find myself truly out of the will of God. And I think you have to be truly out of the will of God, truly out from under His covering, if, for lack of better words, to truly fall into a desire, a, a, a grievous sin. I don't see how someone truly claims to love the Lord, truly knows His Word and desires to study His Word, and none of us can read it enough. You know, LJ has spent the last four years studying the Word, and right now I can tell by the way he speaks, he's probably in the Word a hundred times more than I am. And I'm making no excuses for my shortcomings. But, claim to you, I, I don't see how someone, and, and I don't mean this to be judgmental, but we're talking about, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. I don't see how you can get, you have to get so far from the love of God to really have an affair if you're married. To fall in, you know, start feeling in the earth. That's just two examples I come up with. There has to be something missing in your life right now. And once again, I'm, I'm in no judgmental statement at this. You have to have backed away from the Lord to allow yourself to do that because the bottom line is you have to allow yourself to do it. So once again, for I delight in the law of God. And this is, now I don't know that I completely agree with the finished date. I'm reading from the date study Bible. I don't know that I completely agree that uh, as he states that the law of God is speaking the law of Moses. I like to think it's really the word of God because this to me is my law that I try to govern my life, my life. I almost made my text say my wife. I was going to slip the But, you know, like I said, I'm a scholar. Some of you probably know this better than me. But I truly want to believe that we are, from the verse 22, that I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Your inner being, your spirit should. And if it is truly speaking of the law of Moses, we've got to understand there's a whole lot in the Mosaic law that was not from God. And I'm sure, I, I apologize, y'all. I've always called John, they used to call him little John, I call him Ellen. So I can't get past it. Brother John, I'm sure, could probably okay. explain it more than I could. There's a whole lot of Mosaic law that the Pharisees and the religious leaders in Israel added to it for whatever reason. I've never been overly concerned about that. But I think whatever, if it's a law, you know, even if the law is no excuse, as they say in society, there is no excuse for you to do. None at all. It doesn't matter what educational level you have. If, if you come up across something that you need to know if you're born again, especially if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, which is not necessarily the case, just because you're born again. There's no excuse not to say, God will let you know. The youngest child knows right from wrong. As Cindy's 15 sees her little grandson, eventually he's going to look at whatever you call it, Mimi or whatever. Mimi, I didn't do that when you see him do it. Children will naturally lie. It's in our nature. So, if there wasn't such a thing as a sin nature, if there wasn't this law of sin that we're fixing to read about, why would that happen? And, you know, so to me, verse 21 through 23, and I'm going to read these three again, is a clear picture of walking in the flesh, being controlled by the flesh, not the spirit. Mm -hmm. 
brought by men a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into the captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Of course, that member, that word member just blew me. Remember the limb. If you look up in the Greek, it means a part of the body. I think that's why the scripture's there. If your eye causes you to sin, it's better to pluck it out. The Bible's not teaching mutilation. But if your eye causes you to sin, it's better to go and go and without eye, pluck it out. If your hand causes you to sin, it's better to lose. Now, luckily, that's metaphorical. You don't really have to cut your hand off. But the point is, this is a clear picture of being bound by the flesh. But we just read that we're made free from sin once you're born again. And if you're fine and doing your best to live a life pleasing to God. But when in verse 22 says, I see another law in my memory. And now this is one thing I, because this, this gentleman, Finney Dakes, is far smarter than I am. So I want to read a note from him. This law of sin, the law is stronger than the law of the mind. For it captures man regardless of the, of the protest of the law of the mind. The victory is not occasional but complete. So the bottom line is the law of sin, the reason it is stronger than the law of mind, most of us do not do what the Bible teaches. I think it's Romans chapter 12 where it says, renew your mind daily. Why do, why do we need to renew our mind daily? Especially in the world we're coming from. Ladies and gentlemen, it's, you're hard pressed to go out in public and not hear language that a, a child of God doesn't want to hear. Hard pressed. So you're constantly bombarded with improper language, improper thoughts, improper dress. As I say all the time, women are wearing underwear for outerwear. I don't get that. And at work, unfortunately, where I work, they allow their employees to wear shorts. And, and I always have this over, and I don't know why I'm saying this, but we're about full so Yeah, I'm just going to say it. It's hard to tell if some of these women are wearing t-shirts too long or shorts too short. As long as you see a t-shirt. Same way with men. I see men dress the same way. So it's hard. Luckily, that doesn't really disturb me. The reason I'm bringing it up is we are constantly exposed to the wrong image, the wrong side. And if you don't renew your mind daily, if you don't, as it says in another place, think on these things. You know, like I heard a, a gentleman say one time, you can't keep a bird from flying through your hair. And it, it's happened to me one time. I, I had a bird flying out of my hair. That's when I had long hair. But you can't keep the middle of the net. You can't keep impure thoughts from entering your mind, but you can't keep from dwelling on it. But it takes a conscious effort, especially if you're born again, because the Spirit of God, if, you're, if your spirit is, if you're truly born again, and you're truly filled with the Spirit, the minute the wrong thought enters your mind, you should feel conviction. And, and I heard the, the gentleman we're fixing to have come pray for us, and give a ministry. Brother Paris Reagan, I heard him make a statement that I never have looked it up. I'm going to take it to faith today. The word conviction really means, the Greek really means convinced. So if you're under conviction for something, you're really, the Lord is probably really trying to convince you that that is not good for you. But once again, we see this law. And this law, unfortunately, the law of sin, is quite often stronger than the law of our mind. Because the law of our mind, unfortunately, well, shouldn't be because your mind dwells in your spirit. Your thought process is part of your spirit and soul that is eternal. But if you don't feed that spirit, that, that soul, with the right substance, quick story. You know, I want to take this up for But uh, I read, this is a true article. This friend that lived in New York City had an army buddy that was a Native American. And he invited him to New York City, wanted him to show the city. And that man thought, oh, this, this is too much for me. And they were walking down the street. And if any of y'all ever been to New York or even on TV, it's always crowded. And, and the, the Native Americans, I hear a cricket. And that guy like, man, you're crazy. You can't hear a cricket and all this noise. And he walked over his foot and I can hear a cricket. And he said, there's no way you can hear that. He said, let me show you why. That's what I'm going to hear. He took out a handful of chains and dropped on the side of a dozen people around the top. 
What you're in tune to is what you'll hear. If your mind naturally gravitates towards the improper, the impure, you're going to hear impure the first time. If your mind gravitates towards improper thought, you're probably going to think, oh, I can't believe Brother John said some of the things he said tonight. While they may not have been completely fitting for the pulpit, I didn't say anything about the book. But, that goes back. As a man thinking, so is he. That's not my word. That's why you'll never hear me say, I'm just no sinner saver. Right? That's the problem I have with alcohol denial. And then I will support it. My father quit drinking at the end of his life without alcohol denial. But every time he went to a meeting, hey, I'm doing this for I'm an alcoholic. He ain't drinking much. How are you not alcoholic when drinking? How are you a drug addict when you don't take drugs in? But anyway, that's why that law of sin is more powerful. Because we're programmed to think quite often wrong. And as I said just a moment ago, if you don't renew your mind, as the Word tells us to, you know, it's in the Bible for a reason. Because the Lord knows what we're supposed to. And verse 25, I want to read it to itself, and I will, well, I'll start up skip ahead. Let's look at verse 24 and 25 of Romans 7. And once again, now to me, I read this literally as a present tense, Paul making a present tense saying, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Those two verses have led many to say that Paul was never completely free from sin or he wouldn't make this statement. And once again, I don't claim to be a scholar. But I believe the word of God to be true, and I believe that it's preserved for us the way God intended. I think what Paul is saying, because in another place, we could, Paul has said, oh, look, look, what I will, I will, what I want to do, I, I'm going to paraphrase. What I want to do, I don't do. What I don't want to do, that I do. In one place, he said, I buffed my body in this subjection. I mean, he beat himself. He had to make himself do what was right. And let's think about something about Paul. In the beginning of his ministry, and this is the man that evangelized most of the known world. This is the man that the Lord used like two-thirds of our New Testament. He at once made a statement of himself, I am the least of the apostles. But just before his martyrdom, when he was executed for being a Christian, he said, I am the chief of sinners. You know, we elevate in this society, we start out, in, especially in organized churches, we start out Sunday school teacher. We might be a a youth pastor, then we go up to an associate pastor, then we might be a senior pastor. If we're really an organ, then we might be a, a bishop, we might be an overseer, we might be so we gravitate up. Paul's opinion of himself gravitated up. But Paul taught us more about the flesh, I feel, than any other gospel writer. Because the Lord used Paul to be brutally honest. Because the thing is, can you imagine a preacher standing up today and making the statement? Of course, we know it in the scripture, but if it wasn't scripture, say, you know, I just have to make myself do the right thing. That's faith of Paul saying, could you imagine someone having the courage to do that? How you would look at them? Probably how some of y'all think about me here in my team. But, oh, wretched man that I am, once again, present him, who shall deliver me from this body of, from the body of this death? Paul really doesn't answer the question. I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So if, if verse 25 ended right there, you would think Paul is thanking the Lord for delivering, which we know he did through Paul's other writing. But then you read the next statement, verse 25. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Just because you serve, oh, I want to put it this way, just because I work the bad boy mode, does not mean that I am committed to this 24-7. I'm not. Now, there are times I may get called in on Saturday, but my boss may claim to me I don't have to go. Well, they don't own me. So just because Paul makes a statement, but with the flesh, the law of sin, and once again, I don't claim to know much, but I truly feel in my spirit what this is teaching us is we don't have to. 
Just because we are bound by this flesh, and yes, we are bound by this flesh, until we enter, until the rapture takes place and we receive our glorified body, we are bound by flesh and we have the capacity to sin. We have the capacity to walk away from God. We have the capacity to uh, give away our salvation. I fully agree. No man, no woman can take your salvation from you. The scripture says, no man can snatch it from my father's hand. But I would make exception to that. There is one, yourself, who can walk away from you. Because I don't care what any of anyone, regardless of their degree, if they ever make a statement, it doesn't matter what you do in life, either internally or externally, if you are born again, no matter what sin you commit, you're saved. My Bible teaches me no unconfessed, no repentant of sin will make it in heaven. So if you really believe that statement, that no matter what I do, I'm secure. That to me is a license of sin. That is not correct. And I believe that's what Paul is talking about here. That we are bound by this flesh and we have the capacity. We, and, and given, I'll even go further. We are given the opportunity to sin on a regular basis. We are given the opportunity to fall. And most of them, uh, this next, let me make my statement. I'm getting ahead of myself. We are given the opportunity to fall short of what we know God wants us to do. And for me, most of those opportunities we miss are our own choice. We can choose not to do. But once again, I sometimes wish the Holy Spirit would just grab me by the nap of the neck and wear me out. That's not how God works. God is not going to force you to do anything. And if you're born again, Satan can't force you to do it. He can deceive you alive and glad to. He can plant a thought in your mind. You can grow up, but still, if you're born again, that's why the scripture tells us, with every temptation, God, not the pastor, not the church, not you, God will make a way of escape. But here's what I, how I get that passage in my mind. I might be right here with the opportunity to sin, with the opportunity to do something that will greatly hamper my walk with the Lord. And the Lord may make that mean to escape way over there. Guess what? The Lord is not going to miraculously transport me over there. I'm going to have to take my little feet and walk over to that. I'm going to have to leave this situation. And if, 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 either in a big way or a small way, we've all experienced that. Once again, if you've never had a wrong thought in your mind, praise be to God, you're doing something right. Tell me your secret. But if you've ever had that wrong thought and instantly or corrected it, in the name of the Lord, get what you did. That wasn't your choice. Oh, man, I don't need to think like that. That was probably the Holy Spirit giving you that way out. As I've said before, I have never gotten into trouble. That is, it takes a lot of effort on my part. I have, I have never lost my temper when I couldn't control it. And I want to close because I'm going to keep it on, but I'm going to close this one little part. And we've all probably made the statement, so-and-so just makes me so mad, he just, he just drives me crazy. You know, that is the most ridiculous statement you can make. When you say, let's say you and your father, you and a co-worker get into it, and well, he just made me so mad, I lost my temper. You're right, you lost it. But to say that that person made you so angry, you lost your temper is to say that you gave that person control over your mind. Well, you remember, anger is one letter, and I did this with the youth, you know, filled in for Karen. I had one of my anger on, on the board. A-N-G-E-R. And I put a D in front of that word, anger. You have danger. That's how easy any of us are from falling short. That's, it, it is an act of saying to say you lost your temper. You lost something when you allow your temper to get to the point that it caused you to sin. Because I, I believe that the scripture says be angry and sin not. There's nothing wrong with getting angry. I'm going to be honest with the church would get a little angry about what's going on. If believers get
get a little angry at what's being shoved down our throat, we might see this nature turn around. But as long as we sit back and take everything that's thrown at us, I mean, we're being forced to accept and keep our little squeaky mouth shut, guess what? We're going to work and work and work. And no one, there's no one to blame but us. I believe the church will be, when we stand before the Lord, the things in this nation don't change. Each and every one of us are going to have to give some kind of account on why that happened. I have granddaughters fully in place. And they know I love them. They know, but they also know that I'm a popular as well. Do I beat them up with it? No. But they know how I feel. And that's what's wrong with this church, this world today. The church is sit back and accepting whatever the world wants to. You know, I, I seen a Facebook post the other day, you know, about how Christianity is wants to shove their belief down their throat. And I had to make a comment. I said, well, that isn't what LGBTQ Laying out of the book, I'm not going to correct all the I don't even know sure what all the letters mean, but they keep adding to it. But isn't that what that movement is doing? They're not wanting equal life. And this goes right along with what I'm teaching because there is a law of sin, there's a law of God, and there's a law of our mind. We can choose to accept it, we can choose to ignore it, or we can choose when we have the opportunity in the proper way. To stand against it. No. Christianity, yes, unfortunately, the church, some churches have. Some Christians go too far and do try to shove them out people's throat. But as a movement of hope. And I said, this is where our country has gotten to. If you stand up and say anything that you disagree with, you're wrong, you're hate it. And ladies and gentlemen, the day is coming. I believe I just really heard it's already happening in Canada. And that's not that far from it. They're not that much of a different government. We're just going to be against the law to even read the scripture that speaks against them. You think that sounds out there, but if we don't stand up and realize that there is a law of God that we're held accountable to, that we need to defend, I like what he said this morning. No, the gospel itself can stand on its own, but it has to be put out there. And the church got to the point where as Paul just read, I find, I delight the law of God inside. You just read it. I know, I, I know that's what I'm told. Forgive me. Hey, we're Pentecostal. I am here for Once again, this is verse, chapter 7, verse 21. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God. In other words, I delight in God's word. After the inward man, but I see another law in my memory. Warned against the law of my mind. Otherwise, warned against what I know to be right. And bringing me into the captivity of the law of sin. Which is in my members. So, if, if the Lord saw fit to have the Apostle Paul write these words, that don't you think it's relevant? Don't think it's possible today for us as born again believers to accept what is, what is being forced upon us. Because we don't want to be thought of as politically incorrect. We don't want to be thought of as, as hated. This word is just as relevant for us as it was Paul. It's just as relevant today in 2022 as in the year that Paul wrote in the church of Rome. There is nothing new under the sun according to the Bible. And if the church individually and corporately doesn't start looking at themselves with a little bit more critical eye, I don't know what the future holds for. Yes, I know we win. Everyone is saved again. You say, well, we're winning again. But what about that person that isn't saved? What about that person that is bound by this lifestyle? What about this person that will not accept the help that has been offered to them? Or about that person that doesn't have help offered to them. Yeah, we're all right. We're safe. This is a whole lot that is.